probably one of the most beloved of all David's songs that he wrote. Certainly has been sung by the saints through the centuries. Even our modern composers have put music to the 23rd Psalm. It is preached many times at memorial services. It is a psalm that reaches every portion of our lives. Perhaps that's why it's one of the most loved. It is a psalm, though, that deals primarily with the thanksgiving and praise that David has for his shepherd. It is a, a marvelous little six-verse psalm. And uh, I, I memorized it when I was in Sunday school. Didn't become a Christian until I was 21, but I memorized it anyway, and then, of course, forgot it. But, uh, and today, I could perhaps try to uh, recite it to you, but, uh, you know, old age has caught up. And so, uh, <laughs> it's better that I read it to you. And nobody knows exactly when David wrote this song, to the Lord. It's, it's to the Lord and to his faithfulness, his care, his compassion, his perpetual presence that David understood. Nobody knows whether he wrote it when he was young, when he was a shepherd boy. He knew shepherding, that's for sure. And one of the interesting things we'll find out is that he definitely knew sheep too. But I kind of think, and maybe this is just because of my age and seeing the faithfulness of the Lord through my life for so many years, and just like David, in the ups and the downs, in the victories and in the failures in my own life, and the consistency of the faithfulness and love and compassionate care of the good shepherd in my life. I think perhaps, and this is how I'd like to think about it, you can have your own thought, that it was David looking back over his life. Many of us here have walked with the Lord for many, many years and seen his faithfulness in our lives over and over and over again where he has delivered us from the presence of evil and from our own selves. It is just this marvelous little piece of scripture that I had never actually preached on before. So this is the maiden voyage here. Hadn't really studied it that carefully before. But since we were gone off island for the last three weeks, I had plenty of time to constantly think about the fact of what David said right off the bat in this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I tell you what, I found myself saying, yeah, the Lord is my shepherd, and I have never wanted for the really, truly deep needs, the things that God saw were good for me and for my walk with him. I've never wanted, never really wanted physically. I, I've known want, that's for sure, and probably all of us have, just like David, but never really wanted. My soul and my heart have always been satisfied with God. If you can say this morning that the Lord is your shepherd, oh, I tell you what, this is a great psalm for you, a great song. If you can't say that the Lord is my shepherd, personally, like David did, you can. It is a matter of simply, as the children sang this morning, of placing your trust in Christ and his work on the cross for you personally. Let me read this to you to get a little sip of water here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What an amazing few verses, isn't it? If you need courage and comfort 
If you need security for the future, this is the psalm to listen to this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, Yahweh, the Lord. He uses this divine term for Jehovah God based on the Hebrew verb to be. It is the I am. I am who I am. God told Moses when Moses said, who shall I say sent me to lead your people? Tell them the I am sent you. The one who is, the one who has being within himself, the true and living God compared to the idols of men's minds and demonic doctrines. The Lord, God Almighty, creator and sustainer of all that is seen and unseen. The Lord of the Sabaoth, the Lord of the hosts of the armies of heaven, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the one who sees darkness, the same as light, who never sleeps, never slumbers. The Lord God Almighty is my shepherd. I'm not just one of the flock. I'm not just an unknown. Oh, no, he's my shepherd my shepherd, and because of that one thing, everything else. I can say here in these next verses, this little song, I can be absolutely positive and sure that he will be faithful in these areas. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. We live in a world that is unsatisfying. The Bible says the heart of man is never satisfied. Do you, do you realize that? Do you understand that? The heart of man is never satisfied. If it was, Madison Avenue would be out of business. Advertising wouldn't work. The new and improved, which has always been a question to me. How can it be new and improved? That's just always so weird. <laughs> the, the new and improved, this, that, and the other thing, you got to have it. They keep changing technology on us all the time, so we got to have it. Got to upgrade. The heart of man is never satisfied unless the Lord is your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I tell you what, when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, guess what he's saying between the lines? I'm a sheep. I'm a sheep. Guess what? Everybody's a sheep. The question is, who's your shepherd? We're all sheep. And you know what? When David says that, it's a very humbling statement. See, and if you want God to be your shepherd, because somebody's shepherding you, believe me, or somebody is. See, this is an evil world system that is backed up and dominated by Satan and the demonic realm, or it's your flesh, or it's some kind of weird religious thing that you're into, philosophy, whatever it is. Somebody's shepherding you. Or maybe you think you don't need a shepherd. See, the problem with humans ever since Adam and Eve sinned is that we all want to be shepherds. We all want to call the shots. That's original sin. Autonomy from God. Call the shots. What's right? What's wrong? Where we go? Where we stay? David, he was a smart guy. Oh, he was a man after God's own heart, wasn't he? The most important thing to him and the one thing that he really wanted to do was to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and to behold the beauty of the Lord, a man after God's own heart. Heart of gold and feet of clay. <laughs> feet of clay. Oh, he had his ups and downs in his moral character, didn't he? He was a man who was a man of bloodshed, a man of lust. Through all of that, through the betrayal of family, through being chased by Saul, all of the rest. One thing was consistent in David's life. And that was the faithfulness of his shepherd. I think if you look back at your life, really take a minute, you're going to find that even when we are faithless, God remains faithful because he cannot deny who he is. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. You see, 
Sheep are really the dumbest creatures on earth. Now, I'm telling you, you have to admit you're a sheep. If you're going to have a shepherd, if you're going to have the good shepherd, they are just the dumbest creatures on earth, I'm telling you. They're cute, though. Cute, yeah, cute and woolly. So it's a big ball of wool with these little tiny, skinny, spindly legs. And they are just skittish and afraid of everything. They are so dumb that they <laughs> really, literally, will wander off. They're just prone to wander, as the great old hymn says. And then they can't find their way back. See, I started thinking about sheep. There's this great book called The Shepherd Looks at the, at the uh, 23rd Psalm. And there's a lot of this info in there that you might enjoy reading. I started thinking about myself. I started thinking about all the things we're going to read about this morning in this. And I thought, oh, yeah, I can identify with that. Prone to wander. Whoa, oh, that looks good over there. Um, oh, that looks really good to eat over there. Poisonous? Ah, tastes good. No worries, you know. Sheep are like that. They'll just wander off. They take constant, vigilant care of the shepherd. Let me read you what uh, Matthew says when Jesus looked at the multitudes. It's in, you know, turn to it, Matthew 9, verse 36. And seeing the multitudes, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd like sheep without a shepherd, literally harassed and thrown down. Compassion, that's what the Lord has for sheep, even sheep without a shepherd. For his own sheep, which he purchased, because of course the shepherd owns the sheep. With his own blood, Jesus purchased us. His precious, precious blood, taking upon himself our punishment, that was justly due us. He makes me lie down in green pastures. <laughs> One of the crazy things about sheep is that they're absolutely defenseless. I mean, they're no good against any predator whatsoever. They don't have fangs. They don't have horns. They can't run fast. They're just this big ball of Velcro that's easy to grab a hold of for a predator. <laughs> and stuff sticks in them, too. By the way, they're filthy, so... I can identify with that too. So he makes me lie down in green pastures. This is one of the funny things about sheep is that even within the fold, even within the flock, the male sheep are always vying for dominance. They want this little area with the ewes, of course, to call their own within the flock. And so they must always stand steady and strong on these little skinny legs. Little skinny legs. And they're always budding heads to create this little section of dominance. And the only time that that doesn't happen is when the shepherd is in the middle of the sheep. Do you get the illustration? See, men have a tendency, even within leadership in the church, to be buttheads. I mean to buttheads. <laughs> they have a tendency to do that. They have a tendency to do that. But, it's on camera. Cut that out. <laughs> Cut that off. What can I say? Am I red? I got sunburned yesterday surfing too much. We, butt, we can butt heads when we're in the flesh. And you know what we need? We need the shepherd in the middle of the sheep. When Jesus is in the middle of the sheep, then there can be peace and harmony. The sheep will just stand there ready, butting heads. And they won't lie down. They won't digest their food. They won't take nourishment. Where do we get our food from? Well, the word of God, of course. And when you don't have the word of God in you, it's all up for grabs, thrown around by all kinds of things. And the shepherd has to make us lie down. You know, God makes us do things, don't you? One way or another. Easy way or the hard way, head or gut, either way, he's going to get you, going to make you do what he wants you to do for your own sake because he loves you. Makes me lie down in green pastures, and David is thankful for that, and I'm thankful for it. He leads me beside quiet waters or still waters. You know, sheep are afraid of running water. They can't swim, at least not very well. They just float, 
So they're probably afraid intuitively and instinctively that if they fell in, they'd drown. So they can have the hottest day of ever, and they'll just stand there and look at the water going by because it's just scary. So the shepherd has to lead them, not to a stagnant pool, not to something that will harm them, out away from the running water to where the waters are quiet and still. And it's the peace of, that passes all understanding that Jesus can lead us into, where we can be refreshed. Our hearts can be refreshed. David goes on and he says, he restores my soul. That, that is an amazing thing, restores your soul. How many people need restoration? All of us do, one time or another, don't we? We need to be restored to that place where we're useful for God again. Because sheep and humans wander. We wander off, and oftentimes when sheep would wander, they would get themselves turned upside down. And there's one thing about a sheep, and you can get the picture, big woolly ball, little tiny, little, little tiny skinny legs. They would just lie there on their backs in the hottest of days, and just wiggling their little stick-like feet up in the air toward heaven, as we do when we fall over on our backward. We just fall and wiggle our feet toward God. Can't do anything about it. The shepherd has to come and right that sheep. It's an old English term called a cast sheep. And it's that same picture upside down. God comes and restores our soul. Comes to us gently through the work of the Holy Spirit and usually through a brother or a sister comes and is willing to come after us with that little crook and right us again and get us to that place where we're back in the safety of the fold and under the constant care of our loving shepherd. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but that way leads to death. God has the right way for us to go. The way that he determines is right. The righteous way. What is right in God's mind. But we have a tendency to wander off on what looks good over here or there. But he brings us back and guides us in that place of righteousness. Because his name is at stake. His reputation is at stake. Because he has said that he is the good shepherd. He has said that he will watch over his sheep, that none would be lost. You notice that our Lord leads, doesn't he, and guides. He leads us and he guides. He doesn't drive us. You can drive cattle, that's for sure. But sheep have to be led. And we're led by none other than the greatest leader of all, the one who led us through the cross, on into the presence of the Heavenly Father. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Hmm. For thou art with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The more, just the moment that you are born, you begin to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It is one to one. Barring the soon return of our Lord and the rapture of the church, each one of us will face the reality of passing from this life into eternity. And yet we walk through the shadow. That shadow is always there. At around 26, your body begins to die. <laughs> At 68, your mind begins to die, for sure. We all walk through that shadow. Sometimes that canyon, that narrow little canyon that David would have understood, that they had to walk through and he had to lead those sheep through to get them to that green pasture, to get them on the other side where the light was shining and casting the shadow gets very, very dark and very, very narrow. 
And there's probably, if we went around the room here, many of you who have walked in those dark and narrow places, those deep darknesses, through an illness, through an accident, whatever it might be. But listen to David. Even though I run hurriedly through the valley of the shadow of death and and hide around every corner and worrying all the time, I'm just terrified. No, even though I walk confidently because you're there. Because for the Christian, for the one whose shepherd is the good shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep, there is no fear in death. There is no evil waiting for us. There is no hell. There is only being in the presence of the eternal God with joy unspeakable. It's all going to be good. And finally, you'll be able to say when you're in heaven, it's all good. It's all good. Ah, what a great deal. We can walk confidently. And an old pastor friend of mine, about eight years older than me, and um, I remember him preaching on the beach in Santa Monica when we had beach evangelism eons ago in the 60s. And he's preaching to the crowd and saying, you can never really face daily life until you can face death. Bob Dylan said it, that great theologian. He said to a newsman who said to him, how can you take what you do in your song so seriously? And Dylan looked at him and he said, how can you take what you do so seriously when death will cancel everything you do? For the non-believer, that's it, with the prospect of hell on top of that. Every meaningful thing, everything they've collected, everything, constantly they are in the shadow that death will take it all. But for the Christian who allows God to be their shepherd and the Holy Spirit to work through them in life, we have nothing but gain. Didn't Paul say it? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't know if you can say that today or not. I hope you can. I hope you can. Coming to Christ is a simple act of will. Realizing you're a sheep, that you're absolutely helpless to live this life destined for an eternal separation from the good shepherd later on and simply relinquishing your will to God by believing what Christ did for you on the cross was sufficient and efficacious for God to be able to to forgive you of your cosmic rebellion against him and just coming to him open-handed. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We're walking through it every day. No respecter of age or person, gender, nationality, wealth. We walk through it. We can walk through it confidently, though, can't we? We certainly can. Why? Because God is there with us as our shepherd. He has a rod and he has a staff. A rod was a little piece of wood about this much, something really strong, maybe like oak. It had a knot in it, and the shepherd would pound little bits of metal and stuff into it. He used that to whack off predators. It was a, well, you know, could get them. The staff, on the other hand, was this beautiful long thing that had a little crook on the end of it so he could help pull the sheep out of a bad spot. He would hold it over the opening of the pen where the sheep were held, and he, the sheep would walk under that. He would count each one by name so that none would be lost. You know, the good shepherd knows you personally. He knows you by name. He loves you. He'll always care for you. He's walking with you. He's got everything squared away. See, the interesting thing about all this, before I go to the very end of it, is that all these difficulties of life exist. Huh? This isn't where David is pretending that they don't exist. This isn't where he's saying, well, God's going to deliver me from all the difficulties of life, all the things 
that I wish I didn't have to do. By the way, they call that heaven. It's heaven where that happens. But what he does say is he says, through all of the tough times of life, through all that we have to experience, God is there as my shepherd, leading, guiding, protecting, comforting, all that. David changes the imagery a little bit here in verse 5. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. God is presented here as an amazing host, as a host who prepares this table for David. One of the commentators said that this is literally, in the original text, a victory feast, a victory feast in the midst of all of the opponents and detractors that might come against a sheep of the good shepherd. Another commentator said that David might have had this thought in mind, that in these new little fields, these beautiful grassy little places that the shepherd would take the sheep to, that there would be these little adders, these little poisonous snakes that would hide in the ground, and the shepherd would have to go through with his staff, and he'd have to beat the weeds, and then he'd find out where those little holes were, and he would place from his bag this thick, nasty little ointment around the lip of that hole where they lived. And then he would put it on the head and the nose of the sheep. And when the adders tried to get out of their little hole, they couldn't get out because it was slippery and it would coat them. And if they did get out and tried to bite the sheep on the nose, which they would do, and it would make the sheep quite sick and even kill many of them, they would smell that pungent ointment, that oil, and go back in their hole. And so in the midst of their natural enemies, there's this beautiful table prepared. And for all of us, with the devil and the demonic and the evil world system that would come against us, there is a table. I think of the scripture that simply says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How hungry are you today? Are, are, you, are you willing to come up to the table? Are you willing to enjoy the bread of life? Are you willing to sit there and let God serve you with these amazing blessings? Oil and anointing has always been having to do with blessing. God says through his word in Ephesians that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is in only one place and one place alone, and that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, as we close it up here. Surely goodness and the old King James mercy, loving kindness in this translation, will follow me all the days of my life. Why? Because God is with him. And God is good all the time. And his love is never ceasing. He pours it on us. He showed us how much he loved us, didn't he? By dying on the cross in our place when we are still sinners. They're going to follow him all the days of my life. And if that's not enough, listen to the security and surety in David's words here. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Didn't Jesus say he was going to prepare a place for us? Those of us who know him as shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep. He has, of course. He's waiting for us. He'll welcome us in, wrap his arms around us, and we will have the joy of praising and worshiping him completely and fully without the flesh to deal with for all of eternity. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing to have composure and comfort and courage and provision, satisfaction in our souls now, only to look forward to death as a door walking through the valley into the very presence of the living, exalted, resurrected King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords. Is the Lord your shepherd this morning? Can you say that confidently? If he is, admit you're a sheep. Let him guide you and do all that he wants to do as a shepherd. If he is not your shepherd, if you do not know him personally as David did, you need to just in your own heart and mind today say yes because none of these benefits are yours without him being your shepherd. Father, we thank you with all of our heart that there is none like you, the Lord of glory, condescending to be our shepherd, to guide us, to lead us, to bring us safely through this life, whether it is a short walk through the valley of the shadow of death or a long walk. We will be in your presence forever. And for everyone who is here, Lord, who knows you, may we desire to be like David, to dwell in your house forever, all the days of our life now and forever, and to really behold your beauty. May we love your word so that we know the right path. We give you all the praise and honor and the glory, and as always, Lord, I say, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Amen.